In the foothills of the Himalayas, between the mountain kingdoms of Nepal and Bhutan, a finger of Indian territory reaches northward from the Bengal plains right up to the border with Tibet. In these cool, temperate valleys, some of the world's finest tea is grown. And there's a fascinating mix of Indian, Nepalese and Tibetan cultures in the district capital, Darjeeling. Created in the 19th century under the British Raj, this mountain refuge from the heat and dust of India's plains used to be the summer capital of Bengal. Familiar British architecture combined with verdant springs and cool summers to make the place a perfect reminder of home. Even now, it still has a special atmosphere and has become as dear to the heart of the present-day Indian as it ever was to the British. The one outstanding relic of the old days is Darjeeling's Victorian toy train. Before the line was opened in 1881, it took three days by horse and cart to travel the 50 miles from the Bengal Plain up to Darjeeling with its distant views of the Himalayan peaks. The new railway, built to India's smallest gauge, two feet, was slow even by 19th century standards, but it did cut the trip down to eight hours. At an altitude of over 7,000 feet, the little train threads its way through mountain villages with inches to spare. For most of its length, the railway and the old hill cart road have to squeeze on the mountainside together, creating a roadside tramway. The railway merges imperceptibly with the area it serves, unlike the broad gauge main lines of India which dominate the landscape. A veteran reporter of the Indian scene, Mark Tully, in this clip from his film Steam's Indian Summer, tells us how in the 1850s the Governor General of India, Lord Dalhousie, tried and failed to standardise the railway gauges in the subcontinent. Lord Dalhousie decided that India's national gauge should be 5 foot 6 inches wide, which is almost a foot wider than the British gauge, and that allowed the railways to run monster engines like this one. But unfortunately, his successors didn't heed his wise words. They allowed a meter gauge network to grow up as well. Now, this is the broad gauge track, and that's the meter gauge track. And you can see the gap between them, and you can imagine the problems that that has caused to Indian railways. And as if this meter gauge problem wasn't enough, there also emerged a tiny gauge. In fact, more than one tiny gauge. Some people called the tiny gauge toy trains, but I can assure you they were not. Engines like this used to perform the all too serious task of pulling me up the hill to school in Darjeeling. And this sort of engine is still running on the Darjeeling line, although they're more than a hundred years old now. But the name, the toy train, has stuck. It no longer conveys the sons of the Raj, but it still provides a useful local service. Starting at Siliguri, terminus of the main line from Calcutta, the Darjeeling Railway was opened in 1881. Originally 51 miles, the line is now 55 miles long. A new main line to Assam, opened in 1964, 
took the broad gauge away from Siliguri, leaving the Darjeeling line stranded without a connection. The four-mile gap was filled by this stretch through Siliguri Market. It's India's newest two-foot gauge line. New Jalpaiguri is now the broad gauge junction and the Darjeeling Railway's link with the rest of India. The toy train seems to have blundered into the wrong century as it enters this large modern station, obviously built for much bigger trains. The Darjeeling train still has its loyal passengers, but that may have more to do with the cheap fares than any love of small steam engines. Just outside the station, the narrow gauge engines are prepared for the day's work. They were designed in Manchester by the Sharp Stewart Company in 1889 and dubbed the B class, replacing the original Class A, which could only haul 39 tonnes up Darjeeling's gradients. The Bs are only slightly bigger, but can manage 50 tonnes. Like all steam engines, they're labour intensive, especially museum pieces such as these. It's nothing short of amazing that the new millennium dawned with 14 of the original 34 still surviving. It was inevitable that diesels would come eventually, the only surprise being that it took so long. In March 2000, when these scenes were recorded, the first two had been delivered and were about to start work. This was indeed Steam's 11th hour, and there was just enough time in these final days to complete this composite portrait of the trip to Darjeeling, featuring six of its original locomotives. Just before nine every morning, a narrow gauge locomotive picks its way through New Jalpaiguri freight yards to the broad gauge junction to start the Darjeeling service. Five miles out, on the outskirts of Siliguri, the train crosses the bridge over the Mahanadi River, the only major engineering structure on the line. India being now on the metric system, this is at kilometre seven. Thus far, the train has shared tracks with the provincial meter gauge railways, but now strikes out on its own. We now enter the land of the tea grower, where the estates are usually known as tea gardens. The first one is passed on the approach to Sukhna, on the boundary of the Darjeeling district. Sukhna, at kilometre 18, marks the end of the plain and the start of the foothills. Its pretty gabled station with neatly carved woodwork and gingerbread awnings is the best kept on the line, 
and one of the few in original condition. A far cry indeed from the 60s concrete of New Jalpaiguri. At last the train can be seen in its proper setting. The engine's tiny saddle tanks need constant topping up, and Sukhna is already the second of many water stops on the line. The easy run across the plains is now over. The locomotive is fully watered and oiled, with all bolts tightened in readiness for the hard slog of the mountain section ahead. The long climb to Darjeeling starts with an easy gradient as the line enters the forest above Sukhna. Before the railway came, the dappled sunlight under the trees played upon wild elephant and tiger, who often posed a threat to the railway in its early days. By the time the train has left the lowland forest, the real climb has begun. For the rest of the long haul to Darjeeling, the ruling gradient is 1 in 25, steepening in places to 1 in 20. Kilometre 26 brings us to Rangtong where we reach an elevation of 1,400 feet. This tiny forester's settlement still boasts a station master. The foot of Selim Hill, kilometre 28, is the first of many places where the double reverse or zigzag is used to gain height.
brief easing of the grade allows for a spurt of acceleration on the climb towards Chunbati. The next 20 kilometers contain most of the loops and zigzags for which the Darjeeling Railway is famous. To the lower right of the map is Chunbati, the first of the loops, at kilometer 32. It takes the railway above the 2,000 feet mark. These little veterans really need to be in top form to do the job. Unfortunately, one day in March 2000, the engine ran so short of steam, it was barely able to power itself, let alone its train. It managed to limp the last four kilometers to Tindaria, abandoning its trainload of passengers who were already over two hours late. The relief loco from Tindaria was a long time coming, which added further to the problem. Although the need for new traction was obvious, it did look as if a premature rundown of steam had made things worse. The wayside shrine did little to ward off bad luck on this occasion. On a good day, the train whistles up the approach to Tindaria just after 12 noon. The buildings on top of the bluff are the locomotive and carriage works. From above, the ingenious sighting of the works can be seen, neatly bounded by a horseshoe curve on the railway. Tindaria, at kilometre 38, in the centre of the map, is a small town that forms the hub of the railway community. The workshops are normally off-limits to visitors, but exceptions are made, in this case for members of the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway Society. So little work was in progress, it looked as though steam had finished already. But the line's mechanical engineer, Mr. Chakraborty, assured his visitors steam was safe. It is not wise also to put the old locomotives for the people, those who are coming only by 20 rupees fare in the second class to see Darjeeling. <laughs> okay, so I had the plan, okay, I want three diesel locomotives which will carry the passengers from New Jalpaigu to Darjeeling for the common passengers, those who come to see Darjeeling only. They don't have the uh, heritage idea and they are not interested which is locomotive, which is carriage. No. Yes. They want the transportation <laughs> only. Yeah. I will run all tourist specials yes. by these steam locomotives because yeah. they will be spared <laughs> from uh, this uh, common service. Still steam powered for the time being, the public train romps up to Tindaria village.
both up and down trains are timetabled to cross here, though in practice the meeting point varies from day to day. With its decorated chimney, our locomotive is one of four carrying nameplates. Dating from 1900, it's one of the original sharp Stewart engines rebuilt locally. Locomotives are usually changed here. On this occasion, number 782 is taken off and replaced by unnamed number 791, a comparative youngster, a mere 87 years old. The sure-footed performance of these tough little engines can be seen as number 791 restarts the train on a gradient of 1 in 30. The stretch above Tindaria is one of the most attractive on the line as it winds its way up the side of the next mountain spur. With 48 kilometres still to go to Darjeeling, the train reaches the second loop known as Agony Point from the screech of the wheels on the line's tightest curve of just 59 feet radius. When the down train is late, this siding by the hill cart road just above Agony Point is often used to cross the two daily trains. train approaches the next switchback, the flagman for the road crossing above can be seen sprinting up the bank to be at his post in time. All the way up the line, a small army of pointsmen and flagmen supports the labour-intensive passage of just one up and one down train per day. Diesels will bring no economies here.
Jayabari Station, at an elevation of 3,400 feet, is at kilometre 44, the exact halfway point on the line and the logical place for up and down trains to cross. With the commissioning of the new diesels imminent, this time-honoured scene of the meeting of two steam trains became history shortly after these shots were taken. Local monkeys lie in wait for titbits from the tourists at the tank at kilometre 45. Yet another water stop for the ever thirsty Darjeeling loco. The next kilometre brings the train to the most troublesome part of the railway, the dry water course at Paglajora, meaning raging torrent. Rainfall up to 14 inches in six hours has been recorded here. For most of the year, just a rocky hillside. In late summer, it fills rapidly with monsoon rainwater, cascading with unbridled force down a sheer drop onto the tiny railway track below. One can only wonder at the dogged determination of the authorities who year in, year out, have to carry out heavy repairs to the railway and the hill cart road. The problems are clear to see in these cracks developing in the revetment works beside the line. Raising the rails to cross a new higher bridge over the torrent has meant the down train actually climbs uphill to Paglajura. The 1998 landslide blocked the railway for almost a year.
Another meeting of two trains, this time at the Pagla Jura water tank. We were invited to share the cramped space in the cab to get a driver's eye view of the passage of the mad torrent. Seen from below, the sharp increase in gradient is noticeable as the train approaches the new bridge over the watercourse. The line climbs a long spur and eventually returns along the high road just visible at the top of this scene. At the end of the spur, at kilometre 50, is Mahanadi, at the source of the river of the same name we crossed by the long bridge down on the plain. After a sharp curve at the end of the village, the line doubles back on itself and returns to the Pagladura torrent, 700 feet higher up. Here too, there's been much heavy repair work. Kersiong at kilometre 57 is the only large town on the route and a major centre for the tea trade. It is reached in five hours from New Jalpaiguri if the train's on time. The train obligingly stops at the locomotive shed, 
which happens to be beside the taxi rank, enabling through passengers to leave the train here and use taxis to reach Darjeeling before nightfall. Their places are taken by locals in this more populous area. The station, at an elevation of 4,800 feet, is on a dead-end spur, the train having to set back into the street before continuing its journey. The line runs right through the market here, the stall holders having to protect their wares not just from smoke but from joyriding children as well. Hazards of joyriding have widespread appeal and were indulged in by at least one member of the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway Society who leapt aboard as the train reached a height of 5,000 feet. At this height, the heat and dust of the plains below have been well and truly left behind. Foggy weather sets in at the next water stop at Tung at kilometre 65. The engine headlight is now switched on, an essential safety factor for roadside running.
the lighting faltered, the fireman looked anxiously at the locomotive's ancient generator. It flickered back to life for a moment and then failed completely. But the crew seemed unconcerned and just ran the train blind. When bad weather discourages further pursuit, it makes good sense to stay the night in Kersiong and travel the remaining 30 kilometers to Darjeeling the next day. The traveler with experience of the poorer parts of rural India will be struck by the numbers of smartly dressed school children to be seen at all the towns and villages along the railway. Apart from tea growing, the main industry of the Darjeeling district seems to be education. The local tailors are never short of work. They produce traditional school uniforms that complement the Victorian trains perfectly. At Kersiong, the children even have their own train. The 6.45 a.m. from Kersiong to Darjeeling, stopping at all the schools along the way. This toy town scenario is, alas, all too often shattered by modern realities. When a lorry broke down one morning, blocking the hill cart road completely, the heavy road traffic simply diverted itself onto the railway. There's a limit to how much punishment tiny two-foot gauge rails will take. The train had to be halted until a repair gang could be summoned, while lorries, buses and jeeps continued their assault on the trap. It seemed that 24 inches was just right for the average pair of truck tyres, though the distance between the rails soon became a matter of guesswork. When the gang arrived, the locomotive pushed its way up to the scene to block the traffic, while track gauge and crowbar were brought to bear. delay is all in a day's work for the train crew, who had perforce to be philosophical about the mass desertion to buses of all but a handful of their passengers. The train started off cautiously, with sand being poured onto the rail surface to purge it of accumulated diesel oil and grime from the heavy road vehicles. At the village of Dilaram, one can see what the old hill cart road used to look like in the days of the horse-drawn Tonga. It narrowed here on a sharp bend, necessitating a new alignment for the benefit of motor traffic. The lady sweeping her front step keeps the railway line spotless too, while a customer in the corner shop might find this head-on confrontation with the train a little disconcerting. The next town is Sanada, where the down through train to New Jalpaiguri meets the school train. Again, this is an all steam scene that's now already history. Hey. 
Happily, though, a shortage of new diesels will at least keep the school train steam-powered for a while longer. Although the railway is no longer viable for freight service, its competitor, the aerial ropeway, is still in business. Sacks of grain are hauled from the valley floor up to the Darjeeling Road in just 10 minutes. Not even a modern Japanese lorry can beat that. Passing Jaw Bungalow, the train reaches Goom at kilometre 82. It's the highest point on the line at 7,407 feet above sea level. This is the last stop before Darjeeling, with just six kilometres to go. It's downhill for the rest of the way, past the scenic Batasia loop to the hill station below. The school train should take three hours, five minutes from Kursion, an average of six and a quarter miles an hour. That's if it's on time. The up mail from the plains has a more hectic schedule of six and two thirds miles an hour. But alas, it's seldom achieved these days. Journey's end at last, though it's probably only the train crew who've gone the whole distance, 88 kilometers from New Jalpaiguri. Darjeeling Station was built in 1950, replacing a wooden Victorian structure. Its sheer size indicates the importance of the railway half a century ago. Setting off to explore the town, one comes to the Mao with its old English buildings. Beyond lies Observatory Hill with its fascinating blend of religious traditions. It's an ancient Buddhist site once called Doji Ling, meaning place of thunder, and gave its name to present day Darjeeling. The ritual bells echoing through the trees mark the Hindu shrines lower down the slopes. A more recent arrival on the scene, the Christian Church of St Andrew, is firmly established at the foot of the hill at the end of the Mall. Built in 1873, it forms a lasting memorial to the British community from the days of the Raj. Most of the permanent residents were tea planters, as distinct from government officials and the military who formed a large shifting population. There are a few illustrious names, including that of General Lloyd, one of Darjeeling's founders in 1839. But the Christian faith here doesn't just dwell in the past. Right next door is the Nepalese Christian Church, whose adherents leave the visitor in no doubt that theirs is a vibrant faith looking more to the hereafter.
On the opposite flank of Observatory Hill lies the Windermere Hotel, a favourite with tourists for its atmosphere of the old Raj. Rather like the railway, it's not an intentional time warp, just something that works so well there seems little point in changing it. The most recent innovation is the telephone, installed in 1950. The new railway station was built in the same year, but the original wooden carriage shed was left intact and is now used to house the locomotives. The engines and their shed are both about the same age and the work practices don't seem to have changed much either. But elsewhere on the railway, the pace of change has accelerated, especially in the last two decades, as the following film shows. The most striking difference is on the famous loops. This was Batasia in 1990, still in its original state, the only addition in over a hundred years being a village football pitch. It's now been transformed into a landscaped memorial park with its centrepiece, the new Gurkha Monument. Agony Point Loop now has a tourist hotel on the site and the view from the train is further obscured by new bushes and trees in the public area. It's hard to believe this was the same place in 1990 when a near-perfect view of the Mahaldaran Hills was framed by just four tall sal trees. The passenger train was caught here rounding the curve into Mahanadi station where a short freight was waiting to pass. It was actually only a railway stores train, freight service being already discontinued. The line once had 600 freight wagons, all of which have now been scrapped. Back in 1982, freight trains ran every day and the road was almost empty. Some goods, however, were still being carried the traditional way. The through mail train had four coaches and ran in two sections the second following hard on the heels of the first. Despite its apparently casual operating methods, the line has always had an extremely good safety record. In February 1990, Tindaria Shed was called upon to prepare an extra locomotive for a VIP special. The train looked perfect, with locomotive and vintage saloons all in ex-works condition.
and the VIP? None other than Sir Robert Reid, retiring chairman of British Rail, enjoying a brief holiday as the guest of Indian Railways. Just to be on the safe side, a relief loco brought up the rear. While Sir Robert was being entertained in Darjeeling, we looked at the ordinary train service. The village of Sanada was the setting here for a rooftop view of the early morning school train entering the main street. Local patronage of the trains was good at this time, having had several years to recover since the service had last been cut due to landslips. Typically busy scene at Darjeeling as the local train weaves its way into the station. The vintage saloons can be seen on the left, waiting for Sir Robert Reed's party to return from a private lunch in the town, presumably not at the Shangri-La. Meanwhile, the headlight for the special was checked in case of fog. With every piece of brass well polished, the locomotive crew waited patiently. What couldn't be polished had been painted instead. Sir Robert, in his anorak, posed with his hosts for a group photograph before setting off. Curious shed staff attended the departure of special saloons Everest and Himalayan Princess into the gathering mist.
Unfortunately, visits like Sir Robert's have over the years fostered international awareness of the Darjeeling Railway, with the happy result that it's now been designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Fixtures, such as track and buildings, are covered, giving some protection for the future. The old station at Goom may be a lost cause, though. It might be easy to remove the advertisement hoardings, but the end of the roof boarded in with the station name and the concrete boots, now worn by the once slender iron columns, are probably there to stay. This is how it looked in 1990, with its high, spacious canopy roof, before the alterations were made. At unspoiled Sanada, the sole surviving Darjeeling Himalayan Company crest will hopefully be restored, possibly reverting to its old colour scheme. The charming station at Sukhna may benefit too, perhaps no longer changing colour every year. The zigzags, frustrating for the ordinary traveller, are already billed as a tourist attraction. Paradoxically, the case for UNESCO heritage status rested heavily on the charm of the locomotives, but these stars of the show, defined as movable assets, are technically excluded from the scheme, which has its origins in the protection of listed buildings. Funds to maintain the steam locomotives have now to be found by Indian railways from their tourist promotion budget. Locomotive number 779, Himalayan Bird, the oldest B-class loco in working order, built in 1892, is kept at Darjeeling for seasonal tourist shuttles to Batasia Loop, at a premium fare, of course. Voluntary funding is now important too. The restoration of one of the vintage saloons is being sponsored by the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway Society in the UK. Society members had the pleasure of riding in it during their visit to Darjeeling in March 2000. They witnessed the first public appearance of newly restored Baby Sivok, an event that clearly defined Steam's changing role. This little-known engine had been acquired by the Darjeeling's original owners for track repair work and shunting in 1911. She had spent her last 40 years on display at Siliguri Junction. Why she was chosen for the restoration wasn't clear, as she can only pull three tons on Darjeeling's gradients, just under half her own weight. But she looked pretty enough, with Darjeeling-style saddle tank and coal bunker softening the austere outline of the German Feldbahn loco she once was. As she steamed up towards Tindaria station, it was hoped she might double head or bank the society's special train, but it was not to be. Baby Sivok had never done passenger work and was not about to start now. She shadowed the special as far as Agony Point, so at least she could be seen out on the line.
train engine, an unaccustomed follower posed on the loop for the group's cameras, and then baby Sivok bowed out after a brief debut of uncertain significance. Retired Darjeeling locomotives seem to be a popular choice for public display all over India. An interesting exception to the usual B-class tank engine is to be found in a park in Bombay. This elegant C-class Pacific tender engine was one of two delivered to the Darjeeling company in 1914 for branch line service on the plains. Perhaps one day it could steam again on excursions from Siliguri to the forest at Supna. But whatever happens on the heritage front, so long as the Darjeeling Railway survives, the unique relationship between the line and the people it serves will survive with it. The railway has become as much a part of the culture of the hill people as the tea gardens, the schools and the Himalayas themselves. Hopefully the skills of the locomotive crews perfected over the last 120 years will continue to be handed down so that future generations can still enjoy the sight of these gallant little engines on the toy train to the clouds. Thank you. 